We're joined now by Comcash's Cameron Robertson, Brett Scott, the author of The Heretic's Guide to Global Finance, and Jonathan Harris, who is also known as Money Burning Guy. Thanks for joining us, guys. We want to talk a little bit now about where money derives its value. And as you know, currencies now for decades have been untethered from gold and silver and are backed by trust or potentially more realistically forced. Um, but cryptocurrencies have proven that the value of money doesn't exclusively lie in the power of government or in the desirability of precious metals. And so does it matter what money is made of? And Cameron, I want to go to you first because your company Kong Cash creates physical banknotes that are backed by crypto. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So um, Kong Cash is something that uh, we designed to explore this idea. Uh, it, it's somewhere between a cryptocurrency and an art project. Um, the the notion behind Kong Cash, uh, as you mentioned, is trust. So it has an ultra secure chip on it, which generates its keys. And the idea is really exploring this idea of, well, you know, um, <laughs> if I look back in time and I look at older currency, it was based on precious metals or or something that the government had in a bank somewhere. You know, I could actually go redeem dollar bills. Um, with the Federal Reserve up until the, the 1970s for precious metal. Um, but then all of that, of course, ended. And so we took that idea and we turned it on its head. And we said, well, one of the biggest problems in cryptocurrency is it lacks this physicality, which we've understood for generations. It lacks this notion of I can, I can hand this to someone else really easily. And instead, it moves it to private keys. And so with Kong Cash, we said, well, what if you can do the same thing with a cryptocurrency? What if... You can have something that's physical, looks like money, feels like money, can be exchanged for money, and is trustworthy. And by trustworthy, I mean, you know that if I hand this currency to you, that there's a very good chance that you can, in fact, redeem it for the cryptocurrency at some point in time. Um, and it's really playing on this idea that, you know, for the last 50 years, effectively, uh, the U.S. government and other governments have not, in fact, backed their currencies with precious metals anymore. Um, and so it is up to them to either enforce it through, you know, means like the military or to convince people that it has value. And I think that especially in the times that we are in now, uh, a lot of people should be questioning that. So that's not to say that Kong is a solution to that. But I think that that Bitcoin is one of the quintessential examples of people taking back some of that power and saying, well, rather than trusting and believing in government, I'm going to choose something else and, and have a model of consensus where I agree with other people that this holds value. So as a follow up to that, why should I trust Kong Cash any more than I should trust my government? I mean, I understand that something like Bitcoin has the, the backing of a community, but Kong Cash is a bit newer. And, you know, how do I know that it's going to be around and that these notes are going to be redeemable for a long time? Right, right. So each note works via a smart contract, uh, which is deployed. Um, so we use the Ethereum blockchain uh, for Kong Cash, and it's an ERC-20. Um, there's nothing effectively special about Kong. So a lot of people ask, what is the value of a Kong? We haven't set a value for it. There's no market. There's no ICO. Um, it's whatever you want it to be. Similar to Bitcoin, uh, it has an emission schedule. So a certain amount of Kong can be printed in a physical version. And then there's a small amount of digital Kong that's released as well. Uh, the physical Kong can be redeemed after three years by the smart contract. And the smart contracts are non-upgradable. So when we deployed them, that's it. So if, if we wanted to change Kong, we would have to hard fork it or effectively make a new note. Um, but as to what the value is of a given note uh, and, and what it's worth, until there's a community or someone who accepts this for a good or service, it's worthless. Um, so that's, it's, it's more uh, demonstrative of let's explore physical cash as a means to understand cryptocurrency. Um, and, and so stepping back for a second, thinking about what that means, I can hand this uh, to anyone. I can hand it to my dad. I can hand it to my niece. They don't have to know about private keys or using a cryptocurrency. Um, instead, they have a familiar form factor that looks like a dollar bill. And unlike, say, a hardware wallet, which they might throw away, they might not understand that the private keys have a lot of value associated with them, they do understand and appreciate that money is valued by other people to some degree. You know, there's someone out there who's willing to take a $100 bill when you buy groceries. 
And so that's one of the biggest things about the form factor of it is we believe that the form factor of cash and money is actually really important for people to grapple with its value and make sense of it. So on that note, uh -huh, um, Jonathan Harris, would you consider a Concash note worthy of burning? Yeah, yeah. I want to burn a Concash note, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, really, uh, I, I was really impressed with what Cameron was saying there, uh, what he called the form factor, I suppose, what I'd call the aesthetic. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I think it's easy in the cryptocurrency world to uh, forget about uh, money's aesthetic. It's, uh, you know, it has a, it, uh, has a, an impact on our emotions and our feelings uh, and all sorts of other things which are um, uh, equal, if not greater, than uh, the, the logic that uh, the, 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 the cryptocurrency imposes upon us. Um, so I would definitely do, um, burn some con cash and I'd be really interesting to see what happens with it. I had, I thought, to be honest, I, 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 I see that as the way that cash might go um, uh, in terms of, it does, I mean, it's very, it's, 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 it's the way to ensure um, the, the 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 aims of uh, of Bitcoin were always about the personal security and about you know money being your own to spend and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and uh, if you put it on a piece of paper, it becomes that because you can stick it in your pocket and nobody can get it, nobody can steal it from you. Yeah, just as a quick follow up there, Jonathan, I was reading a profile that featured you uh, in the now defunct, sadly, Breaker Mag, and and you were sort of talking about how. Uh, the idea of money burning and how it's connected to this notion of cryptocurrencies and, and sovereignty. Um, oh, yeah. And I'm just wondering as, you know, cryptocurrencies themselves evolve, right? Now we have things like Concash coming on the scene. Um, how, has, how have those developments actually affected how you approach sort of money burning as a practice? Uh, well, I, I think the, the key thing uh, that uh, money burning uh, and, uh, you know, a, 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 perhaps I suppose a different way of thinking about money brings up is this this relation to sovereignty. Uh, it seems to be a word that was claimed quite early uh, by by crypto. Uh, and the idea, of course, is is that property rights are a way of ensuring sovereignty. Well, I've got news for you. That isn't how, <laughs> that isn't my idea about sovereignty. Sovereignty has to do with sacrifice uh, uh, and the sovereignty you achieve through sacrifice just uh, property rights pale into insignificance. You know, it's 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 a deeply uh, spiritual uh, thing. It, go, it goes right to the core of your being. So I, I totally get the passion uh, that the crypto has for the idea of sovereignty. But uh, this notion that property rights will get you to this place of sovereignty is mistaken. Uh, there was a great uh, uh, well, I say it was an, it wasn't a great essay, but it had a fantastic title. Uh, 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 which was posted, I don't know, a while back, which, which asked the question, it said, if the point of capitalism is to escape capitalism, then what's the point of capitalism? In other words, if you make a bunch of money to live on a yacht in the middle of the ocean so no one can bug you and you're property secure, well, what's, what's the point in that? Um, so I think, uh, I think um, the crypto space needs to, needs to definitely broaden its thinking, and I hope they'll all come and join me in, in the Church of Bern and... and, and and do that in a way, you know, I mean, burning, burning money, this, it, we don't do it for a purpose, but it, it does have effects. It, it, it brings these, uh, these difficult elements of money that, that uh, uh, it, not just crypto, economists ignore them totally. Uh, it brings them to the fore and it brings them in a way that is not a, not a knowledge, not a data, but it's a, it's a sense. Uh, and I think that's, that's really important. And that's what, that's where the path to sovereignty lies. Brett, I want to uh, put something to you here. I mean, we've been talking about crypto kind of as disembodied and quite abstract to this point, um, but I think cryptocurrencies are arguably less immaterial than they really seem. They're actually, you know, intimately connected to physical infrastructure. Like, for example, mining farms, you know, rely on the electric grid. The internet itself relies on under underwater cables. Um, what do you What do you make of that? Is that for for Brett or for? for sorry, for Brett. Yes. What do I make of it? I mean, yeah, sure. All, all digital infrastructure is essentially um, appears in our minds as a kind of immaterial realm that sort of floats in space, but actually it's situated on the ground and it's in giant data centers. Um, actually, Bitcoin has that through mining farms, which are essentially large data centers. And they're 
um, <clears throat> all underpinned by a cheap commodity extraction from uh, countries like the DRC. So yeah, I mean, it's intensely physical. Um, and actually, the amount of energy that goes into the production of the, the units, uh, I mean, that's essentially just uh, fossil fuel burning largely. So yeah, they're physical entities. I mean, so as a follow-up there, I mean, what do you think the consequences of that really are? I mean, Karl Marx always talks about, you know, sort of the veil of money and what that disguises on the other end, namely like the people who are producing your goods. But for crypto, it's kind of like the veil of the energy being used um, and the resources that are being taken away from, you know, the earth or whatnot. Um, so what do you think the consequences of kind of forgetting about all of that stuff is? Well, actually, interestingly, the cryptocurrency community shares something with the Marxist community in that they both subscribe to commodity theories of money. Um, and actually, this goes often quite an interesting um, revival of labor theories of value when you when you look, sort of look through the, the lines in the crypto community. You see people talking about energy underpinning the value of the currency, which is essentially a disguised way of talking about the labor theory of value. Um, and... Uh, so yeah, there's this. Uh, I mean, I I don't I don't subscribe to commodity theories of money. So I, I think about money completely differently. Um, so to me, there's always a, there's always two elements to a monetary system. I mean, for example, if you look at a cash token, um, the cash token it has a physical body, which is made of a particular a particular thing, but it doesn't derive its value from its physical body. Um, Whereas if you come from uh, commodity theories of money, you always assume that the uh, the, the sort of the, the body of the currency is where it's ex getting its value from. This is why you fixate upon how it's made and all this kind of stuff. Um, whereas the sort of monetary theory that I come from, it's kind of irrelevant how the currency is made. It's what actually the sort of structures of law and the sort of networks that underpin it that um, give it its power. Um, but sure. I mean, right now in the crypto world, you, you sort of uh, created a kind of pseudo commodity. Um, and that's, yeah, I can elaborate on this if you want. <laughs> uh, June, I think you have a related question, actually. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to throw this out to the panel. Um, and maybe it kind of comes full circle back to Concash. Um, you know, is there an irony that this new money, right, that, that cryptocurrency people have claim they have created, um, it's, it's almost a throwback to exactly these types of um, physical bearer assets or, 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 or types of money that are rooted in commodities like gold. Um, I mean, in many ways, you know, if you lose your private key, for example, it's gone, right? Um, and so the Yap Islanders, you know, the people with the rye stones and they would keep use the, the rye stones, the tally as a, as a ledger, um, the Yap Islanders were in many ways more virtual than today's Bitcoiners, right? Because you can lose a rye stone to the bottom of the ocean and it's okay. Um, but if you lose your private key, it's gone forever. So I don't know if anyone in the panel has any thoughts on that. Yeah, that, I mean, I think that's that's one of the, the clearest reasons why... Um, why we went down this path. So, so originally our focus was around secure key storage broadly. We've been working on IoT. A lot of the collaborators on the project have worked on IoT and secure IoT for years. And what we thought of around private key storage is actually really abstract. Um, going and explaining why someone's private keys are super important to, to non-technical folks, um, their eyes might just glaze over. But the problem is a lot of what we're talking about in the cryptocurrency space and, and decentralization, whether or not what values apply, apply to those, rely on private key storage. And, and people don't realize that um, once you're empowered with a private key, there is no backup. So, so we, we used the idea of money as this, this precious token, which is anachronistic. Like everyone, a lot of people say, well, I want digital money. I don't want physical money. You know, there's all these great aspects of digital money um, uh, that, that I don't want. I want digital money because, um, you know, I can cross a border with a million dollars on a USB key. So the physicality of money is problematic um, from that side of things. But it, it harkens back to effectively thousands of years of human behavior, which is built up around these different tokens. And, and one of the things that, that we think about is the physicality of the money is, is in 
different periods of time distinct from the monetary theory backing it. So we talk about like commodity money, we talk about fiat money. Um, that's kind of a, for us, a, less of an issue. We're more interested in let's play with the physicality of it. And the interesting thing is now in a digital form with a digital physical form, you can put it whatever you want backing it. So, so you could have a Kong note, which is backed by Bitcoin instead, or you could have it backed by fiat, or you could have it backed by something completely different. Um, you could do personal tokens for yourself um, based on your own labor. There's all sorts of things, but by giving it a physical form and a piece of paper we're all familiar with, um, it, it goes deep into the, these, these psychological impressions that we have from childhood about it. And so when I think about like burning money, like the idea of burning money as a taboo is fantastic. I mean, that's, that's so deeply ingrained. And for us to do that is, is a really powerful thing to do. Um, so to add to yeah, this, the physical form is really crucial. <laughs> can I add to this here? Um, I mean, one of the, the the best ways to think about this is to make a dis make a distinction between a monetary system and the tokens. So there's a, I mean, the, one of the best ways to think about it, for example, is a train ticket versus a train system. You know, I can hand you a train ticket and I can hand you hand it to you in a in a digital form or a physical form. But it's totally meaningless unless there's actually train infrastructure in place. Okay, so there's a system that makes that all sort of activates the token. So when we're referring to the sort of the battles around the war on cash, which I write a lot, but I mean, cash is the physical implementation of a broader monetary system that can also be done digitally. Um, and I think similarly with a crypto token. I can take a Bitcoin token and then I can, you know, I can in my room here, I can take a piece of paper and write a promise uh, to somebody saying, I promise to give you a Bitcoin token. And now you have a physical um, Bitcoin IOU, which I could pass around, right? That's a, that's a cash form of Bitcoin that I just created right there. Um, and then with what tying back to sort of John's um, realm, the sort of the act of the physical implementation of a currency system is the only one you can actually burn because it's the only one that you actually have autonomy over. Right? Once those tokens are issued out into the public, you then have autonomy, which is very different to a digital system. Um, I guess what's interesting about the cryptocurrency community is it's the first true example of a hybrid digital bearer instrument in which it's issued or it's held upon a ledger, but you control it through this private key, which gives it a cash-like feeling, which means if you lose your private key, it's gone forever, which is set the same with cash, right? I um, mean, I think that's the most interesting thing about crypto um, in general has been about this creation of this sort of hybrid bearer instrument type concept. Jonathan, very quickly, could you respond in about 30 seconds there? Yeah, I can, I, and I can plug my magazine at the same time. So what Brett is saying is great. I mean, it's important. I appreciate everyone probably in this conference understands the difference between crypto and, and electronic money. But Brett did a great piece in my magazine there uh, on how to burn digital cash. And it's an exercise in thinking that reveals a lot about crypto and digital, digital money. It's very good. Think about how could you destroy the money in your bank? And it's not as easy as you think. Yeah. All right, guys. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. It's a pleasure. Bob.